He's unracing to Revelation. And in doing so, we're going to be answering the key questions about Christ's coming kingdom on earth. This will take us more than one study to do that, but I trust it will be very informative and very helpful. Some of this I have taught in the past, some I have not. The scriptures are loaded with verses related to this, and I invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Revelation, chapter 20. Now, when it comes to the return of Christ and the setting up of his kingdom, I want you to realize that that is a very, very significant topic and subject in the word of God. In fact, ever since the day that Adam and Eve sinned and God pronounced the curse upon not only them and the serpent, but on all of creation, that Romans 8 tells us that the creation is groaning, waiting for the redemption that it would experience, and waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, which all occur when Christ returns and sets up that kingdom. In fact, as we think of the promised messianic kingdom in the scriptures, it's interesting to note that 27% of the Bible deals with the subject of prophecy. As we think of the Old Testament, there was over 1,800 references to Christ's return. And in the New Testament, over 300 references to Christ's return. In fact, one out of every 30 verses, 23 uh, deal with Christ's return, and 23 out of 27 New Testament books give prominence to this subject, that Jesus Christ is going to return, and what will transpire when that's the case. In fact, it's interesting to note that for each reference to Christ's first coming in the Old Testament, there are eight verses in reference to his second coming in the Bible. And so this, again, is no small subject. And as we begin in Revelation chapter 20 again, let's start in verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and to the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived, and what did they do? They reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. These six verses, in verses 4, 5, and 6 in particular, refer to the future earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. A kingdom, which we'll see tonight, that will be universal. A kingdom which will be earthly. A kingdom which is certain, a kingdom where the saints of God will rule and reign with Jesus Christ, a kingdom where righteousness and justice will prevail, a kingdom where war will cease and peace will rule, a kingdom where the wolf and the lamb shall dwell together, a kingdom where the universal knowledge of the true God will dominate, a kingdom where the Past promises made to Israel will finally be fulfilled. A future earthly kingdom where Jesus Christ will rule with a rod of iron. And this future and certain kingdom of Jesus Christ will be the ultimate of what man for centuries has longed for on earth, but has been unable to produce as there could be no peace on earth till the Prince of Peace 
was present and ruling. This future earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ, which Revelation 20 is referring to, was repeatedly predicted in the Old Testament. It was prepared for by John the Baptist, who preached to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was prayed for by the disciples as they petitioned the Father with such words as, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ was the message that Jesus Christ and the apostles originally preached as they proclaimed to Israel the gospel of the kingdom. And though Jesus Christ repeatedly substantiated his claims to be Israel's Messiah, and though God made a legitimate offer to Israel of the kingdom, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day rejected him and had him ultimately crucified, postponing the kingdom on earth. But dear friends, since God is omniscient and sovereign, none of this caught him by surprise. For God in his grace, while holding the guilty responsible for the rejection of Christ, turned Israel's rejection of the Messiah into the most tremendous blessing that could ever occur. For it is through Jesus Christ on that cross that your sins were paid for completely. The punishment that should have fallen upon us from a holy God fell upon our substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. And on that cross, a sin was poured out on him, and he experienced separation from God, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On that cross, he also cried out, it is finished, as your sins were paid in full. And he had you in mind. He was dying for you, to provide salvation for you, as a gift that's received through simple, childlike faith in Christ. And only God can turn cursing into blessing. And only God can turn the most hideous crime on the most innocent victim into a blessing for a guilty, sin-infested world as only God, who truly loves us, would give his only son as a substitute for us so that through his sacrificial death, our sins would be paid in full. It is amazing but true that God's plan has been in place and God's plan will ultimately be worked out. And in God's plan, the promise he made in the Garden of Eden to crush the head of Satan and to reverse the curse will ultimately be fulfilled. Not in our day, but in a time to come. In fact, as we think of what they saw in the Old Testament again, remember, they saw the birth of Christ. They saw Calvary. They saw the Antichrist. They saw the kingdom to come. They saw the new heaven and new earth. They saw the holy city. What they did not see was the valley of the church. This is what they did not see. What Christ is doing today. But they saw a, the kingdom to come. They didn't know when it would come, but they knew many things about it. As the Old Testament says more about the kingdom to come than the New Testament. Do you know why that is? is because that kingdom was specifically promised to Israel, being the focal point of that future reality. Now, in order for there to be a reverse of the curse, in order to be peace on earth, in order for righteousness to rule, in order to have a kingdom on earth, you have to deal with the great foe and enemy of God in order for that to occur, and that is Satan. So the question is raised, what will happen to Satan? during Christ's kingdom on earth. And chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, tell us, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. It's, a key is something which you can open a door. And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, has that occurred? You know, there are those in our day who are amillennial who believe that that's true, that Satan presently is bound. I mean, like I've said before, if he's bound today, he is the greatest Houdini I have ever seen. I mean, he isn't bound. In fact, we know he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we will see his destiny, we will see his fate, we will see his end 
in Revelation chapter 20 in a later study. And we'll devote a whole study to Satan his, and his whole you know, involvement on this planet and his destiny. But what will happen to Satan there's Christ's kingdom on earth? He will be bound in the bottomless pit. Verse 30, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished, but after these things he must be released for a little while. Notice, as we think of the stages of Satan's downfall, we recognize in his rebellion against God, when he said, I will be like the Most High God, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 20, which, by the way, I definitively believe refer to Satan. And I say that because there are those today in Bible-believing circles that don't think Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 do refer to Satan. The problem with that in Ezekiel 28, it says you were in the garden of God. And obviously the king of Tyre was not in the garden of God. He goes beyond the king of Tyre to the person behind the king of Tyre and his, you know, uh, diabolical, energizing person, namely Satan. Satan fell in his rebellion against God. We know as a result there was the great war between him and God began. We know that at the time of the flood, prior to that, there was the loss of many of Satan's demons to Tartarus by virtue of the Genesis 6 plot failing. We know that he was judicially crushed at Calvary, and yet he still roars or roams about and roars like a roaring lion. We know in um, uh, Revelation chapter 12, he was defeated by Satan at the midpoint of the tribulation, and he pours out his wrath, especially upon Israel. We know at Armageddon again, there's this defeat, and he's put in the bottomless pit, also called the abyss, are also called Tartarus. And he's going to be there for a thousand years, and then he's released for a little while before he ultimately will be put into the lake of fire. Now, don't you love reading the scriptures and finding out the beginning from the end and how it's all going to end? Satan does have an end. And you see, one of the wonderful things about biblical Christianity is while we acknowledge the reality of evil in this world, Unlike yin-yang and Eastern mysticism and so forth, we know that one day evil will cease. One day God will stop sin and evil in this world, and there will be a new heaven and new earth. But here Satan is bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And notice he's called the dragon. He's referred to that in Revelation 12. He's called the serpent. Why? Because he was in the garden using the serpent. By the way, do you know again, there are seminary professors in our country who do not believe that Satan was the serpent in Genesis 3. Now these are not in liberal seminaries, but supposedly Bible-believing seminaries. That serpent of old who is the devil and Satan. The word devil, diabolos, carries the idea he's the slander, he is the liar, and Satan means he's the adversary. He's the liar and he's the adversary of God. And notice, what is he involved in? Deception. He uses religion in our day and various means of deception. And here, when he's finally cast into the bottomless, shut up and a seal upon him, now he should deceive the nations no more. That means in the meantime, what's he doing? Deceiving the nations. And in fact, during the tribulation period, his deception will be so great that if it was possible, Jesus said, even the very elect would be deceived. And so as we think of Satan, in order to have this kingdom on earth, he is bound for a thousand years. Now that leads us to a second question. How long will Christ's kingdom on earth last? And let me say that the answer is in two stages, as it were. Stage number one will be 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Six times in these seven verses, 
Beginning Revelation 20, we see the term thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. Well, I said seven times, didn't I? Six times. Okay? Six times. And you know what thousand years means? Thousand years. That's what it is. Thousand years. And that's why sometimes it's called the millennium. Taken from the Latin word for a thousand. A thousand years. You know what years means? Years. That's what it means. Not an indefinite period of time, a very definite period of time that God has marked out. But I say it's the first stage of his kingdom. In fact, you know, as I think of the Lord, as we think of his coming, there are two comings. As we think of his second coming, there are two stages. First, there is the rapture for the church age saints, and then he comes back to the earth with his saints to set up his kingdom. And when it comes to his kingdom, there are also two stages. There's this thousand years followed by the new heavens and new earth. And I say that because the Bible repeatedly says Christ's kingdom on earth is going to last forever. Forever. And we will actually see that in Revelation 20, and then we move on to 21 and 22. Now, as I think of this, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 say this. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, namely the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve who? Jesus Christ. His dominion is what? An everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, if you've studied the book of Daniel, and we have done that a few years ago, you recognize in Daniel 2 that Nebuchadnezzar had this vision, and Daniel 7, he had another vision. And there are parallel visions about the fact that there was going to be these world empires in which the Gentiles would rule. There would be Babylon, followed by Media Persia, then Greece, then Rome, then the revived Roman Empire. There was going to be judgment. And then there was going to be setting up of Christ's kingdom. He's the stone that fills the whole earth and is going to topple all other human kingdoms. And this again will be fulfilled when Christ returns. And that's why with Christmas right around the corner, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, familiar verses at Christmas, what does it say? For unto us a child is born, and that's his humanity. Unto us a son is given, for he was always God. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Government carries the idea again that he is a, a king. He's going to rule. And his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let me just camp for a moment on those names. Wonderful. Some think it's Wonderful Counselor. By the way, you want to get some wonderful counsel from someone and the trials that you're going through? Why don't you get it from Jesus Christ through the Word of God? Prince, oh, next, Mighty God. If Jesus Christ is anything less than God the Father, Mighty God is the wrong description of him. And yet he is, equal with the Father. Everlasting Father, literally the Father of the ages, and he is the Prince of Peace. And until he comes back, there will be no peace. I don't care how many peace treaties are signed. I don't care how much the UN, which I have nothing good to say about, tries to set a peace on earth. There will be no peace till the Prince of Peace is with us. Now watch this, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Where is he going to rule? Upon the throne of David. What's he going to rule over? His kingdom. What's he going to do in that kingdom? He's going to order it. And he's going to establish it. And he's going to do it with judgment. And he's going to do it with justice or righteousness. 
From that time forward, even how long? Forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God will perform this as promised in the future. And so as we think of how long will this kingdom be, the first stage is a thousand years, but that's just the first stage of the eternal kingdom that will be set up in the eternal state involving the new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem, which we'll eventually get to if the Lord doesn't come before we finish this earth. Now that raises a third question. Who will inhabit Christ's kingdom on earth? Who's going to be in that kingdom? And let me give you five answers to that. First of all, church-age saints. Church-age saints. Verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Now, if one has studied the book of Revelation previously, they know in chapter 2 that this is the very promise given to the overcomer, the believer in Christ, and the church age. He's talking about church age saints sitting on thrones, and judgment was committed to them. Verse 4 continues, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Can you give me some more details? Yes. Who had not worshipped the beast. All oh, these are tribulation saints. Or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they live. Now how do people that are dead live? And reigned with Christ for a thousand years. How do people who are beheaded live? Well, as we'll see in a moment, it requires a resurrection. So there are church age saints. Secondly, there are tribulation saints that will be inhabiting this kingdom on earth. Thirdly, there are Old Testament saints. Old Testament saints. In fact, if you go with me to Daniel chapter 2, Excuse me, chapter 12. Daniel. Now, Daniel knew nothing of the church. Why? Because the church is an Old Testament mystery. It wasn't concealed. It was concealed in the Old Testament. It wasn't revealed until the New Testament. And the New Testament apostles and prophets, according to Revelation, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people, that's Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble, that's the tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people, now who's Daniel's people? The Jews shall be delivered. They're going to be saved from all that's involved in the tribulation by way of their destruction. Everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep, that's a term for the death of a believer, in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now, for those who are sleeping by way of death, some to everlasting life, that's one kind of resurrection, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, that's a second kind of resurrection. You see, there are two general kinds of resurrection. The resurrection of the just and the unjust, here, one to everlasting life, the other to shame and everlasting contempt. Ultimately, condemnation, which will be fulfilled as we will see in Revelation 20, at the great white throne judgment. And so we see here that these individuals are going to be resurrected in order to, again, enjoy the kingdom that was promised them. Fourthly, in this kingdom, there's going to be the apostles of our Lord having a very prominent place in the kingdom to come. Now, to see this, go with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 
chapter 19. Now, the apostles of our Lord heard much teaching on the kingdom. In fact, after Christ's death and resurrection and before he ascends into heaven, they ask him in Acts chapter 1, Lord, will you at this time set up your kingdom in Israel, just like you promised us? And he says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. This is what you need to remember. The Holy Spirit's coming, and you're going to be witnesses. But they had heard a lot of kingdom teaching. And in Matthew chapter 19, we pick it up. In verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Let me pause for a minute. Why is it difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, we know from Mark chapter 10, in a similar kind of statement, it's because they are prone to trust in their riches. You see, in order to be saved and have eternal life, and ultimately, in this context, enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to put your trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And rich men too often don't see their need of Christ. They buy what they need, or they bribe, or they do whatever is necessary. They don't see a need. They're content usually with things down here oftentimes. Though they're not ultimately content, and that's why they commit suicide and they move from one relationship to another and so forth and so forth. But what is impossible with men is always possible with God. That means there's nobody outside of the reach of the grace of God. No one. Verse 27, the Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? In other words, Lord, we put our trust in you, and we've been saved, but we've gone beyond that. We've left everything, and we've followed you. We have been your disciples. We have sought to serve you. What do we have to look forward to? Verse 28, so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, which will occur when Christ returns, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, notice throne means he's the king, he's sitting there, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. And you're going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And many who are first will be last and the last first. Well, what's he saying here? He's saying that when you have been willing to put Jesus Christ before everything else, follow him and serve him, it will be worth it all when you see the Lord. He's taking all of that into consideration. Now, this is not a passage directly related to the church. It's kingdom-oriented. It's pre-Calvary and so forth. But it's a wonderful reminder that the apostles of our Lord are going to be there, and they're going to be in a very reigning position over Israel in particular. It's going to be worth it. Now, Jesus reaffirms the same thing in Luke 22, verses 28 through 30 as well. Now, in order for church-age saints to inhabit the kingdom, or in order for tribulation saints to, who have been beheaded, who have died to inherit the kingdom, in order for Old Testament saints who have been dead long ago to inherit the kingdom, in order for the apostles of our Lord, who all died in the first century by 95 AD, to be inhabiting Christ's kingdom on earth, what does all this require? It requires a bodily resurrection. A bodily resurrection. That one day, the, our bodies will be raised. Now, we recognize, as we think of a bodily resurrection, that when someone dies, there is a separation again of their soul and spirit from their body. That's what physical death is about. 
for the believer, their soul goes to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Their body, however, goes into the ground or the sea or somewhere, awaiting the day in which their bodies will be resurrected. And remember, resurrections always deal with bodies. The Bible does not teach soul sleeping. The Bible teaches body sleep. And as we think of the resurrections, and we'll develop this more when we get to Revelation 20 and the great white throne judgment. Again, as we think of uh, the resurrection of church age saints, this happens a split second before the rapture of the church. The dead in Christ rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will then come back in our glorified bodies to rule and reign with Christ. It is at that time when Christ returns that the Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs, those who have died during the tribulation, will be resurrected in order to enjoy their long-promised kingdom. This is all part of the first resurrection. Christ's resurrection, church-age saints' resurrection, Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs' resurrection. This is in contrast to the second resurrection of the unsaved to judgment at the great white throne. No wonder Revelation 20 says, Blessed and holy are those who have a part in the first resurrection. That's the resurrection you want to be part of, the resurrection of the redeemed, of the just, of the saved. And as a result of being resurrected with glorified bodies that will not decay, will, there will be no death, there will be no deformity, and so forth, they will function in some very important ways in this kingdom to come. But if you notice closely, it says here, tribulation martyrs, those who've died. Because you see, at the end of the tribulation, when Christ returns, while we've seen already that the unsaved are removed from the earth in order to enter the kingdom, what about those tribulation believers in unglorified bodies with sin natures who survive the tribulation and enter into the kingdom? They're going to be functioning there in the kingdom with the capacity to sin and the capacity to reproduce. And that is why a fifth group that will inhabit Christ's kingdom on earth are reproduced children in the kingdom still having sin natures. And we could add their parents as well. Their parents as well. It'll be very interesting. Uh, quite a mix of people. Oh, you're Joe Glorified Church Aid Saint. Oh. Oh, you're Susie, tribulation martyr. Glorified body. Oh, obviously you're not glorified because I can smell you. You're B.O., you know, the next guy. I mean, it's going to be a very interesting mix of people there. In fact, go with me, if you would, to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. And as Isaiah was pronouncing judgment to come and captivity for the children of Israel, laced in the book of Isaiah are also these verses, and yea, even whole chapters devoted, but, but, God's not through with you, Israel. One day, God's going to send the Messiah. One day, you're going to turn to the Lord. One day, he's going to set up his kingdom. One day, he's going to set up the eternal state. You have a wonderful future to look forward to, though God is disciplining you in the meantime. And there in Isaiah 65, let's begin reading in verse 20. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. 
They shall not build and another inhabit. Why not? Because they do not die. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor, now catch this, bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Now what we're seeing in this passage is that the mortality rate in the kingdom is perhaps almost nil. And because of that, literally in that thousand years, billions of people will be born. In fact, I talked to Dr. John Whitcomb about a little over a month ago when I was in Indianapolis preaching there. He happens to live there. I visited with him for about two hours. He's 87 years old. And we were talking about this, and he stressed me, Dennis, over that thousand-year period, billions upon billions, Billions of people will be born and live. You know, just think, if there is no mortality rate, per se, and therefore, you know, and people are still um, fertile, just imagine how many kids you could have. Just imagine kids having kids having kids. On and on we go. Thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions, yea, billions of people repopulating the planet in unglorified bodies with sin nature, dwelling among those in glorified bodies without sin nature, with Christ ruling on the earth. And it's very clear from verse 23, they're going to bring forth children, but not for trouble, and they're going to have an offspring. There are going to be those who live during this time that are born, there's going to be, again, tremendous population growth. Ezekiel 47 and verses 21 and 22 mention this. Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. And we'll look next Wednesday night at how the land is going to be divided among the tribes. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as inheritance for yourself and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native-born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. But notice, there are those who bear children among you. In Zechariah 10, verses 6 through 8, the prophet says this, I will strengthen the house of Judah. I will save the house of Joseph, the Lord says. I will bring them back. I'll bring them back to the land. Because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside. For I am the Lord their God, and I will bear them, I will hear them. Those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them, for I will redeem them, and they shall increase as they once increased. Notice again, they're going to have children. There are going to be children born during the kingdom. Again, to do that, you can't have a glorified body. It has to be by people in unglorified states. In mortal bodies with the capability of reproduction. And so, here we are in the kingdom to come. Christ is ruling. Church age saints are there. Old Testament saints are there. Tribulation martyrs are there, all in glorified bodies. Then there are those who came through the tribulation, saved, unglorified bodies, able to reproduce, and having children all over the place. So what happens? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, how long? A thousand years. Satan will be released from his prison. He's released for a little while, just like verse 3 says. 
And he is going to go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Notice there's going to be nations, groups of people all over the planet, including Gog and Magog, but not the same as Ezekiel 38. This isn't the same battle we're going to see. It's a different one. To gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. I mean, that means there's a lot of people populating the planet. Verse 9, they went up, On the breath of the earth, with Satan as their king, following Satan, and they surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. And how did God deal with them? And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is the last rebellion that we see here. What will this ultimately result in? A worldwide rebellion against Jesus Christ as king. And when people say, well, you know, you're just a product of your environment. This is the best environment possible. You've got Jesus Christ ruling. You've got the curse basically removed. You've got the economy is never so good. No stimulus packages at all needed. The economy is great. The king is fair. The court system is tremendous. I mean, there's peace, there's righteousness, there's everything you want, and what do they do? Underneath it all, when given the chance, they rebel, is what they do. Now, why? Is it because of Satan? No, what is he? He's bound for a thousand years. And when he's finally loose, there they are. Why? Because in their heart, underneath, a large percentage of those people that are born never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They were never regenerated. They never received a new nature. All they had yet was a sin nature. And they, like some teenagers living in Christian homes, chafed under the Christ authority and said, in essence, I can't wait to get out of the old man's house. And when given the opportunity, boom, they're there, following Satan, only to be devoured by fire out of heaven. And you know what this shows? That in every dispensation, under all conditions, whether conscience, whether human government, whether promise, whether law, whether grace, or whether kingdom. Man is incurably a sinner, unable to save himself, a rebel towards God. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. You're rearranging the furniture in the room if you don't recognize the sinner in the room as the problem. And that is why even when we look at our court system today in our country, the purpose of a court system is justice, not rehabilitation. And while indeed we recognize, apart from the grace of God, so go I. On the other hand, the best law can do is restrain the flesh. It can never give you a new heart and a new nature. Only the Lord can do that. And it can't give you the power of the Holy Spirit either, which is needed to live the Christian life and to see righteousness produced in your life on a practical level. And that is why under the best of circumstances, with the best ruler ever, the best economy ever, the best governmental system ever, the best justice system ever, man still rebels because by nature, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You don't even know it and neither do I. Only the Lord knows how wicked we are underneath. And every so often, a few of the maggots from the garbage can spill out in our life. We go, ah, look at those maggots. And the Lord says, that's nothing. You should see what's in the can. That's why we don't live the Christian life out of our flesh. We live it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God does not change your sin nature in this lifetime. One day he will remove it. And one of the reasons heaven is heaven is your sin nature is gone. In the meantime, there's a spiritual battle going on in your life, and you either yield to the flesh or you yield to the Lord to be controlled by the Spirit from day to day. And if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We see rebellion against Jesus Christ as king. But by the way, the last rebellion. After this, there is no more rebellion. Notice they came from the nations. There was a large number of them, and they rebelled, and God had to judge. 
Now this raises a fourth question. How will Christ be functioning in his kingdom on earth? How will Christ be functioning in his kingdom on earth? And the key to that question is found in the word kingdom. Christ will be functioning as the king. He's the king. In fact, when he comes back, according to Revelation 19, we read in his second coming as he's making his way to the earth, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will what? Rule them with a what? A feather. As he went and heard a flea. Oh, no. With a rod of iron. Why does he have to rule them with a rod of iron? Because he's still ruling over who? Sinners, right? He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Of all the kings that have ever existed, he is the king. Of all the lords that ever existed, he is the Lord. He has no competition. And when he comes back, he indeed will fulfill those promises made in both the Old and New Testament. He's going to come back. He's going to defeat the armies of the world at Armageddon. He's going to, we know, you know, remove the rebels of the earth. There's going to be the sheep and goat judgment. He's going to cleanse the temple. He's going to set up his government. And he's going to establish his kingdom. We know in Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with them, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. A throne indicates he is who? He is the king. By the way, is he sitting there now? No, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father now. He is not sitting on the throne of his glory, as we'll see in a moment, which deals with sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, ruling the world from that epicenter, the world. By the way, there are those who are called progressive dispensationalists who believe that Christ is presently on the throne of David. Not true. Again, as we pointed out earlier in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, this verse is loaded with the idea of his kingship. He has a government upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. To order it, he's going to order the whole thing. I want you to do this. We're going to do that. That city is going to be directed, governed by so-and-so. Da, da, da. He's going to order it. He's going to establish it. And he's going to do it with judgment. And he's going to do it with justice. Totally fair. And he's going to establish that kingdom forever. And so this leads us to question number five. On whose throne and where will Christ rule? And the answer to that is Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David and rule from Jerusalem. We just saw it in Isaiah 9. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to rule from Jerusalem. But to see this, go with me to Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. You can see why a Jew familiar with the Old Testament would long for their kingdom to be set up and look for their king to come. Why women would even pray in the Old Testament that they could be the mother of the Messiah because he is the hope of Israel. In Jeremiah 33, let's begin in verse 14. Behold, the days are coming and this is in the future, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah, speaking of his covenants. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth, speaking of the Messiah. In those days, Judah will be saved from her enemies, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord our righteousness. For thus says the Lord David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. David's never going to lack a man. 
And there will be a day in which Jesus Christ, who is a descendant of David, is going to sit on that throne. In those days, in those days, not happening now, but in the future. Judah is going to be saved. Jerusalem will dwell safely. Is Jerusalem dwelling safely today? <laughs> Hardly, right? You know, I'm amazed again at individuals who do not interpret the Bible in a consistent, normal, grammatical, historical, contextual way, who takes passages like this and say that they're not going to be fulfilled or that they're presently being fulfilled spiritually in the church. That is just... You have to deconstruct the words of Scripture to conclude that. And so as we think of Israel today... Think of Israel today. Here it is, about the size of New Jersey, but it's in the center of the earth, and here is the key city, which will be the headquarter of Jesus Christ and the kingdom to come. It is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And we will see several things geographically about Jerusalem next week. Now, that is why in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33, we read, and behold, you will conceive in your womb, Mary, the angel said, and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Mary, he will be great, and he'll be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him what? The throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob how long? Forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Hasn't happened yet. But why does God do this? Because God always keeps his promises. And as we've seen throughout this series, again, God has made this covenant to Abraham and his descendants regarding a land, regarding seed, and regarding blessing. And that is why the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant spin off of that. Israel has never enjoyed their land yet, but they will in the kingdom to come. And from that seed will be a throne, a king on a throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be tremendous blessing in the kingdom to come. Now this leads us to uh, another question. Over whom shall Christ rule? Over whom shall Christ rule? And the answer is over all the nations. Not only over Jer Israel, ruling from Jerusalem, but over all of the nations. In fact, Zechariah 14, verse 9 says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. In that day, not in this day, but in that day, when he comes back, he sets up his kingdom. He shall be king over what? All the earth. He's not king today. In fact, he can't hardly put up a nativity scene anymore how screwy it's gotten around here. In Psalm 2, the Lord says, as the nations of the earth seek to gather together to fight Jesus Christ, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That's in Jerusalem. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you what? The nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling and kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Now catch this. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Again, this is speaking of a future event. It's talking about, it's giving instruction to the kings of the earth to serve the Lord, to rejoice with trembling, to kiss the sun. To kiss the sun in what sense? When you would come before a king, you would bow down and you would kiss his hand, as it were. And the reason you need to bow down is because you have put your trust in him, is the idea. 
And so again, we see it's the nations of the world. You know, I don't know if the United States is going to be a nation at that point. We don't know. We just know that all around the world, he will be ruling over every nation. And who's going to be ruling with him? Under his headship. Faithful believers, especially church age saints. Faithful believers especially church age saints. And I say that because Revelation 5, verses 8 through 10, as we saw the scene of in heaven after the rapture of the church while the tribulation is going on. And what did we read in the past? Revelation 5, 8 through 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the title deed of the earth, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and gold, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue, and people and nation, and have made us what? Kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth. But who's reigning on the earth? The Lord is. But who's reigning with him under his authority? appointed by him into governing roles over nations or cities or so forth. Faithful believers. In fact, we're told in Revelation 2, 26 through 29, and he who overcomes, the believer, and, and here's a second condition, keeps my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He said, I thought the Lord was ruling with a rod of iron. He is. But the Lord is using means to do it, including faithful believers. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also receive from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to who? The churches. In the New American Standard, Revelation 2.26 says, And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Authority to what? To rule, to reign, to make decisions. And you know what is tremendous about this? Is when you have authorities without sin natures, under the headship of Christ, you're going to have the best of authorities that you could ever have. Now, Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, that this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him and we did, we shall also live with him, and that's a promise. If we endure... And it's assumed that some believers will. We shall also reign with him. If we deny him and assume some believers will, he also will deny us what? This privilege of reigning with him. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, though. He cannot deny himself. Praise the Lord. So as we think of even this kingdom in the future, in this millennial age here, notice the church is going to be reigning with Christ. Israel is going to be head of the Gentiles. Christ will be ruling from the throne of David. And the Gentiles, the sheep, will be in a position of blessing. And in fact, everyone will be in a sense of having that kind of situation and conditions on earth. Which leads us to question number eight. What will characterize Christ's rule on earth? And you know, two words that are mentioned specifically in Scripture a righteousness and faithfulness. Righteousness and faithfulness. I mean, wouldn't you like a righteous ruler? You say, well, this kind of sounds like a monarchy. It is. And there's nothing wrong with that form of government, a monarchy, when you have Jesus Christ as the monarch. In fact, go with me to Isaiah chapter 11, while it's fairly handy. Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, we begin in verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, that was David's father, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and that branch is again, or that rod is, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of the Lord 
shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. By the way, this is the sevenfold spirit mentioned in Revelation, chapter 1 and another place as well. Sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit that was true upon the Messiah. Seven things mentioned here. Verse 3. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, or seeing some glove slipped on. Verse 4. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity or fairness for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Catch this, verse 5. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Notice, he's not going to judge by the sight of his eyes, decide by the hearing of his ear. Isn't that how we judge today? And we have fallible judges today, don't we? We have judges at times who let criminals go, and other times, on some occasions, the innocents are wrongly condemned. In that day, never a wrong judgment. By the way, no appeal process in the kingdom to come. No court of appeals. Boy, you know, lawyers are out of a job in this situation. Righteousness, faithfulness is what's going to characterize that kingdom. This leads us to question number nine. What will happen to the curse during Christ's kingdom? The answer is, it will be essentially removed. It will be essentially removed. Now, I'll clarify what I mean by essential in a moment. But while we're in Isaiah 11, look at verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. By the way, does that happen today, like I've said? Yeah, for about a minute, you know. Verse 6, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fat lean, they're going to lie down together, and a little child shall lead them. Is that happening today? Now, we have zoos today for a reason. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Would you let your nursing child be by a cobra's hole today? Are you kidding me? And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Why? They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What we see here is that the curse is largely removed. In fact, and I'll point this out next time, there is a verse in the scriptures that indicate that curse is removed except that the serpent will still have to crawl in his belly and eat the dust of the ground. Now, as we think of this, go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We've had some really nice weather lately, haven't we? And you know, you might have walked out and looked at the leaves or what's left. It's, wow, this is beautiful. This is great. But do you realize that if you could hear the sound of creation accurately, you would hear groaning. Now, when you're in a hospital room and you hear someone, you hear groaning, what do they want? They want help. They want deliverance. They want something, right? Now, what does creation want? We're in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, in believers, church-age believers, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, the curse, death, decay, disease. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. What hope? Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope. We have this to look forward to as a result of being saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. You know, the older I get, the more my body groans. And the more I look forward to a new glorified body. Now, I've had a lot of knee problems in the last two years. I've got torn cartilage in both, bone on bone in one, and arthritis in both. And you know, in the meantime, I might get some new knees. But you know, even then, nothing like a new glorified body. In fact, I am convinced that God even allows the dying process and getting old to prepare us for that and to cause us to want to go home and to see this as a great hope. But in the meantime, creation's groaning because you know what? They want it too. They want the day in which the sons of God are glorified, that the resurrection occurs and the curse is removed and nature will flourish in the kingdom like the very Garden of Eden. Which leads us to question number 10. And this is our last one tonight. What will be true spiritually of Christ's kingdom on earth at its beginning? What will be true spiritually of Christ's kingdom on earth at its beginning? And you know the amazing thing answer to that is, all will know the Lord. Not at the end, not after it gets repopulated, but at the beginning. All are going to know the Lord. Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is that true today? No, there are many who do not know the Lord. In fact, the majority do not. Many have never even heard a clear gospel. And yet in that day, all will know the Lord. Isaiah 11, 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You say, well, what about as a result of being saved, or the result of the kingdom getting set up, the children that are born, don't they have a chance? Don't they have a chance? They do. In fact, this is an amazing account here. Catch this. Isaiah 54, 8 through 13. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, the Lord says. But with everlasting kindness, I have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. Do you know in the kingdom to come, children will be born and they will have the best teacher spiritually that has ever walked on the face of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, as we saw in Revelation 20, 
many, many, many will rebel, not believe him, not believe the truth, and will rebel. Showing again the incorrigibleness of sinners. I ask you tonight, have you come to put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you been saved by the grace of God? Can you look forward to not only dying one day or being raptured and going to meet the Lord in the air, but one day enjoying the kingdom to come? And not only coming into that kingdom as a redeemed sinner, but also even having positions of service there that bring honor and glory to the Lord because you were willing to faithfully serve him in the middle? What a blessed hope we have. What a wonderful future we have to look forward to. And that's why for those of you who may have rejoiced and gloried or, or groaned in light of the elections in that last week, Mickey Mouse compared to the future when the Lord comes again. Our hope is in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful grace. And thank you that you were willing to send your son, yes, to offer the kingdom to Israel, but by being rejected to die on the cross for our sins. And thank you that you did not cancel your promises to Israel. You merely postponed them. And in the meantime, Christ is building his church and offering salvation to Jew and Gentile freely by your grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And should anyone be here tonight who has never been saved by your grace, who don't know for sure if they die, they're going to go to heaven, may tonight be the night they settle that issue. They find out those answers. They understand the gospel. And even tonight, Father, as we remember even the 35th anniversary of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald and the lives that were lost on that ship in Lake Superior, I'm reminded how they got on that ship that day not thinking they were going to die, but they did. And we don't know when we're going to die either. But thank you, Father, that when we've trusted Christ, we know we have eternal life. We know absent from the body is present with you. And your love and grace motivate us now to live for Jesus Christ. And we're reminded even in these passages how worthwhile it will be to not only cast our crowns at the feet of Christ, if indeed we are rewarded for how we lived after we were saved, but also, Father, that we know you will reward us in ruling and reigning with Christ in very special ways. Thank you for your wonderful grace to us. May we redeem the time that you've given to us now by serving you in the power of the Spirit, by the grace of God, according to your word, as we walk by faith and not by sight. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Willie, next Wednesday night we have at least another 10 questions we want to answer regarding this coming kingdom. It's an amazing, amazing study of what we have to look forward to. And we will talk at some point again in a little more detail about what will be the role of church age believers in that coming kingdom and so forth. What's it going to be like on the earth? What's the topography? What's the geography? And several things spiritually that are going to be true that might even be amazing and surprising to some of you. And we'll look at that next Wednesday night. This Sunday, again, is our normal schedule, 8 and 1045. If you want to read Esther chapter 7, it's great. Read in advance. And we'll also be having our 930 class on principles and parenting, as well as Romans. Hope you can join us. And do keep in prayer those things that were mentioned tonight as well. Um, so with that, we're actually going to end on time, and you're free to fellowship.
need a song. Well, I guess we do have a song. Maybe we won't end in time. But okay. We're close. We're close. Uh, I think we have a song, don't we? It may be today. Let's sing. There is a message written in the Word of God for me. My Savior put it there to ease my load of care. I read, let not your heart be troubled. I will come again that with me you will be throughout eternity. The Christ I love is coming soon. It may be morning, night, or noon. My lamps are lit, I'll watch and pray. It may be today. It may be today. So many hearts are broken here. So many tears are shed. But Jesus gives sweet peace. His comfort brings relief. He'll come again for those he loves. The part someday. And Jesus will break through. I'm going up, are you? The Christ I love is coming soon. It may be morning, night, or noon. My lamps are lit, I watch and pray. It may be today, it may be today. This is the Christian's hope and light, a beacon in the storm. It still sends forth its light to make the pathway bright. The dead in Christ and we remaining shall be upward caught. Oh, what a day twill be, blessed day of victory. The Christ I love is coming soon. It may be morning, night, or noon. My lamps are lit, I watch and pray. It may be today, it may be today. Thank you, you're dismissed.